Hello and welcome to the 741 channel. Today I'm going to be replacing the electrolytic capacitors on this Johnson Viking 4740 CB radio. So I did find a Sam's photo fact for this radio. I'll leave a link in the description in case you want to download it. So after skimming the photo fact, I realized that here on page 42 and 43 was a complete list of electrolytic capacitors. But it would have taken me a few hours to go through this list, find equivalents on Mauser or DigiKey, and then make sure that they would fit the radio. So I opted to go with the pre-sorted kit from Klondike Mics instead. So if you're interested in seeing the process on how to develop your own capacitor kit, let me know in the description and maybe I'll make a follow-up video and go through the detailed steps on how I would go about making my own capacitor list from the photo fact. So I'm going to start by taking the radio apart. And I've already removed the four screws that hold the chassis to the cover. So now this will just slide right out. So taking a look at the solder side of the board, nothing really remarkable here. It's just uh, an old circuit board. The only thing noteworthy is the Johnson Viking logo etched right into the copper pattern. So here's a look at the component side. Everything here looks pretty clean. Hopefully we don't have any surprises as we start going through this 40 year old radio. So I've got some things here to help me get started with the job. The first is a solder sucker. I've also got some fresh solder here. And sometimes adding fresh solder to the old solder will help it flow a little bit better. Now I've got some solder wick here too. And this is useful for the last little bit of solder that the sucker can't get to sometimes. And then over here, I actually have a bulb style solder sucker. And I kind of have mixed results with this thing. But I've kind of got it out and heated up and ready to go in case I find that it works with this one. And of course I got my regular soldering station heated up and ready to go. So I'm going to start in one corner and then just work my way around the radio, replacing each capacitor one at a time. So I'm going to start removing this capacitor by first trying to determine how the pins are arranged. So it may be a little hard to see in the camera, but there's a black line on the side of the capacitor body, and that marks the cathode or negative pin of the capacitor. And that means that the positive or anode pin is on the opposite side right here. So if I flip the radio over and look in the general area of where that capacitor is, I see a pin pattern that matches here and here. So this is where I'm going to desolder first. As you can see, there's quite a bit of metal in the pattern right here. So I'm going to add a little bit of fresh solder to try and help the old solder flow. That seems like that's flowing pretty good. So now I'll bring in the solder sucker and see how much of this we can get out of here. Okay, so in this case we're dealing with a lead that was kind of folded over onto the circuit board before it was soldered. So sometimes an X-Acto knife or something like a pick can kind of help to get those leads straightened out. Another trick for desoldering components is to use this solder wick. Basically what I do is put that over near the solder joint, put the soldering iron on it and just kind of heat it up. And what it'll do is it'll wick the solder from the joint into the copper braid. Now I find this stuff generally is more useful to clean up a solder pad after the component is removed, but sometimes it's more effective at removing the solder than the solder sucker. Now I can also use my bulb sucker, but this thing doesn't always heat up enough to be effective, but we'll give it a try and see what it does here. Now in this case, it seemed like it actually worked pretty good. So I may end up using this for this job. So I've got all the solder off the joints. I should be able to pull this capacitor out of here. So one thing to keep in mind when pulling out these electrolytic capacitors is to remember what the orientation is. So in this case, my negative or cathode pin was facing the back of the radio. Now luckily on this radio, the circuit board is also marked. You can see the spot where the capacitor was and there's a plus sign on the plus pin. But one thing to keep in mind is that the electrolytic capacitor's negative pins are marked on the actual capacitor. So when putting the new capacitor in, I want to make sure that I put the pins in the right orientation or I'll have some problems. So let's take a look at the old capacitor. Right here, you can see the stripe that denotes the negative or cathode pin, which is right here. Now if I spin the capacitor around a little bit, you can see the capacitor's value is marked right here, 470 microfarads. And then below that is the capacitor's voltage rating. In this case, this capacitor is capable of handling up to 16 volts. So now I'm going to go to the Klondike Mike's kit and find the new capacitor that replaces this one. Now a couple things to keep in mind. The new capacitor may be a slightly different size than the old one. The other thing to keep in mind is that the capacitors in the Klondike Mike's kit are usually a minimum of 25 volts. 
so we probably won't have any 16 volt caps, but that's okay. As long as the voltage rating of the new cap is the same or greater than the old voltage rating, we should be good to go. So here's a look at the new capacitor from the kit. You can see the negative stripe here denoting the cathode or negative pin. And then just above that in small print is the capacitor's value, 470 microfarads. And next to that is the voltage rating, in this case, 25 volts. So this is the one we're going to use to replace the old one. And as you can see, it's physically a fair bit smaller than the old one, which should be fine. If it were bigger, it might not fit in the radio, but smaller is okay. So now let's test out the old capacitor and compare it to the new one and see what we get. 529.6 microfarads, an ESR of 0.08, and a V loss of 1.3%. Let's check the new capacitor and see what we get. Okay, so here's the new capacitor, 470.9 microfarads, so quite a bit closer to nominal, an ESR of 0.08, and a VLOS of 1.1%. So now that I know the new capacitor checks out good, I can insert it into the radio. The positive lead is what's marked on the circuit board, but it's not marked on the capacitor, the negative lead is. So when I drop it in, I'm going to make sure that I install the negative lead in the unmarked hole on the circuit board. Now keep in mind, across different radios or pieces of electronic equipment, the circuit boards can be marked differently. So not every circuit board is going to have the positive pin of the capacitor marked. Sometimes it may be the negative. You just have to make sure you pay attention when you're working with this stuff, and you should be in good shape. So I've got the capacitor installed. I'm going to hold it in with my finger, flip the radio over, and then I'm going to bend the leads over just a little bit so the capacitor stays in place. So now I'll tin the tip of my iron and we'll solder this guy in. So now I'll grab my magnifying loop, take a close look, make sure the joint is good, and then I can clip the leads. One down, a bunch more to go. Now the process is pretty much the same for the rest of them, so I'm not going to make you sit through all that, but if anything noteworthy comes up, I'll bring the camera in and show it to you. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the other side when this thing's all done. After removing the large 2200 microfarad capacitor that's near the relay, I realized it had been leaking. Luckily, it didn't leak so bad that it ruined the circuit board, so I caught it in time. I was able to clean up the old electrolyte from the circuit board surface, and I moved on with putting the new cap in place. But having said that, I did run into a little bit of trouble putting the new cap in because it was just a little bit wider than the old one, and I kind of had to force it in between the crystal and the relay to get it to fit. I've got all the capacitors in the main body of the radio replaced at this point. Now what I needed to do was take a look at this unit here. On the bottom of the radio, there were four screws holding it in, so I removed those. And then I had to unsolder this wire from the circuit board. And now I can flip this guy gently over, even though all these wires are still going this way in the radio. And I can get at the few capacitors that are in here. Now I've actually already pulled the lid off of this module, and there's no electrolytics in here. So now for the moment of truth, let's turn this thing on and see if it works. Okay, that's a good sign. The uh, 4K looks really nice. Yeah, I could put a switch in and swap out one of the uh, SDR screens at random to see it. And to be honest with you, it's really not bad. I'm looking at them now, and uh, they're not bad at all. So as you saw, the radio is now working. Now there actually were a few other problems with the radio that I had to fix. I had to fix the loose microphone connection in the back of the radio, I replaced the power cord, and I fixed the signal meter. So if you're interested in seeing any of those repairs, check the links in the description below for those videos. And if you feel like it, leave me a comment and let me know your story about recapping an old radio like this. Did you have success, or did you struggle with it? I'd like to hear about that. So I'm going to save tuning and testing for the next video, which is linked in the description below. If you enjoyed this one, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.